You're listening to Text Me When You Get Home, a podcast that discusses all things true crime, creepy and macabre. If you like stories about murder, alien abductions, paranormal events and other creepy and macabre stuff, then stick around. I'm Sophie. I'm Craig. I'm Sean. If you know anyone that is into spooky stories and true crime, please share this podcast. Please share this podcast with them. Uh, Even a share and a tag on your Instagram story really helps us out. Uh, So this week, I have some quick recommendations. Firstly, I would like to recommend the Obsessed with Disappeared podcast. It's one of my favourite true crime and comedy podcasts. Uh, Each episode, they recap episodes of ID's Disappeared, and I am obsessed with them. Uh, our second recommendation is the Porra Hodcast. Uh, it's a couple of Yorkshire lads watch and review horror films. In their recent episode, they spent a good five minutes talking about sucking heroin up, heroin up through their arseholes. So if you like bombhole banter, and you probably do if you listen to Text Me When You Get Home, go have a listen to them. Uh, so that is Obsessed With Disappeared and Porra Hodcast. Time to get on with today's story. Craig, juicy meaty. <laughs> <laughs> so what will what will you be telling us about today? So today I'm going to be talking about the Black Monk of Pontefract. So, <laughs> so it's the case of the Pritchard family haunting of 30 East Drive Pontefract, a three bedroom council house on an estate in West Yorkshire. Um, the phenomenon was m- made into a movie by Bill Bungay in 2012 called When the Lights Went Out. Good time. Yeah. Um, so the case caused like loads and loads of interest in the 60s and was reported in local and national newspapers and made the locals very excited. Uh, but when the haunting stopped, the interest pretty much faded immediately. Um, and it was almost completely forgotten until 10 years later when a young amateur historian who had a bit of a, a bit of a woody for Cluniac monks. Um, <laughs> he heard about the case and investigated and sort of regained some interest. Uh, the film itself uh, was made in 2012 and the producer found out the house, the actual house, so they filmed it in another similar house um, down the road. They found out the actual house had been on sale for four years after the movie was made. So he kind of kicked himself and he's like, shit, I could have bought the house and made it in the actual yeah. house. Yeah. Um, but he went and bought it anyway. Uh, and now, if you want to, you can stay in the house. I for... do not. <laughs> I, I <laughs> kind of want to be in New Creek. Yeah, I kind of do, actually. Um, this. I will, I will go to the house. I will not sleep in the house. Yeah. Uh, I, I've how read... brave, how brave. <laughs> so I'm just going to start out by saying I am a massive skeptic. I don't really believe in ghosts, but I I read two books on this. One of them is called Poltergeist, A Classic Study in Destructive Haunting by Colin Wilson. And the second one is called The Black Monk of Pontefract, The World's Most Violent and Relentless Poltergeist by Richard Est and Bill Bungay. Um, <clears throat> and I have been having nightmares <laughs> <I've> been, <laughs> you've said it i've been you've causing my wife a... to have nightmares yeah. i have to shut the ensuite door because my dressing gown freaks me out <laughs> so oh, all right someone's doing well for themselves on sweet door nice, right, yeah. nice. <laughs> ensuite and the door fancy <laughs> <laughs> and a dressing gown <laughs> it's a velour dressing gown as well <laughs> with juicy written on the back <laughs> <laughs> it's on the arse bit <laughs> So uh, I'm going to start and I'm going to try, there's a lot to get through, so I'm going to try, uh, give you a bit of a geography of the area. Um, so Pontefract itself, where the, where the phenomenon occurred, is a really ancient town. It dates back to Roman times and the, the name means broken bridge in Latin. It's, the place is completely steeped in history. It's got a ruined priory, which was found around 1090 until, and it stayed there until the dissolution of the monasteries. Um, so the heavy eight. Yes, yeah, so the fifteen hundreds. Um, and generally, the priory would have between fifteen and twenty monks 
living there throughout history. Um, and the area, so the, the there's a castle as well. The castle and the priory are really close together. Um, and the area boasts loads of incredible scenes from history. So in 1322, Thomas, the Earl of Lancaster, was beheaded at Pontefract and his body was buried in the priory. And rumour has it that various miracles occurred at his tomb. And so they, they uh, made it the Chantry of St. Thomas. Um, so now it's a sort of a site that people make pilgrimages to. Right. Um, the fourth Archbishop of York was uh, buried there. This is the fourth Archbishop after Saxon times, so post-conquest right. Archbishop. Various Eng English nobles. Um, the third Duke of York was buried there. And the Priory was finally surrendered to Henry VIII by eight brethren on and one novice on the 23rd of November, 1540. What um, does that mean? Is so, a novice like a, like a, a monk in training? He's basically the one. He was like the cabin boy that they all buggered regularly, I think. And then, <laughs> does, he does he become the black, black monk of legend? I don't know. I don't think so. Oh. Oh, it might be. Might uh, be. He might be just very tired. Um, <laughs> a little bit so. Um, <laughs> No, uh, so... Bumble hole banter. There we go. It took us what between re recommending uh, Porra podcast and saying that if you like bum hole banter, what? I mean, three ten... minutes. Well, we've been live ten minutes, but you know, five minutes of the stream's about to start, and a four minutes of Sean fucking up. So yeah, about three <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the priory. Yeah, you asked what it meant, Sophie. They Henry basically either. Um, took the monasteries by force or they generally surrendered them to him for a large pension is how it went. All right. Um, and the, they, this was finally surrendered by the eight brethren and one novice that still lived there. Uh, so right next door, there's Ponty, Pontifrat Castle that was constructed 20 years before the Priory in 1070 by Ilbert de Lacy on land that was granted to him by William the Conqueror as a reward for helping him during the conquests and it was the uh, its various battles and sieges throughout time. It was the death place of Richard II around Valentine's Day in fourteen hundred. Um, after oh, a nice Valentine's Day death. Yeah, <laughs> nothing <laughs> sets the mood. Like That's it. Yeah. Romance, tragedy, classic, isn't it? Mm, exactly. And it it's mentioned in Richard in William Shakespeare's Richard the Third with the passage, "Pomfret, Pomfret, O oh thou bloody prison, fatal and ominous to noble peers." Within the gilt closure of thy walls, Richard the Second here was hacked to death, and for, <laughs> and for more slander to thy dismal seat, we give up thee our guiltless blood to drink. So, I mean, it's quite well noted that Richard the Second was starved to death. He wasn't hacked, but I mean, who are we to argue? Actually, Shakespeare, yeah, you twisting the truth. Absolutely, you wouldn't argue with Willie, would he? Creative, would he? creative liberties, isn't it? Creative liberties, my word, definitely. We can't. We can't uh, judge him for being not factually correct. No. He definitely re re read that and saw us like starved to death. Oh, boring. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long time. We've only got half an hour on the stage show. <laughs> What's quicker? Yeah. <laughs> Bit of hacking. Bit of hacking. Bit of hacking. So uh, another person beheaded there was um, Catherine Howard, the fifth wife to the fifth oh, really? wife of Henry VIII who also committed adultery with Sir Thomas Culpepper at Pontefract Castle. Yeah. Naughty, naughty. Yeah. Bit was that actually true? Or was that just one of his lies? Well, I mean, she was apprehended and executed without, without trial, so... Classic Henry. That's <laughs> uh, Henry. <laughs> so uh, its last sort of big deal was that it uh, during 1644 and 1645 the site was host to various sieges between royalists and parliamentarians and eventually it was to totally demonic demolished following requests from the townspeople <laughs> they, oh, were, really? they were like i am sick of all your shit just take it down <laughs> and we can crack on so mm. yeah it was demolished um so i didn't want apologies for the uh, the boring history lesson but um Basically, the they think that it's the the haunting is caused by a Cluniac monk who had been hanged for rape around the time of Henry VIII, so it is kind of relevant. 
that's not very godly behavior is it it's not well, then again maybe it is i mean if he's been if it is the uh if it is the cabin boy what's he called the novice maybe, mm. he, was, maybe he just wanted a bit of retribution maybe so um, so our historian visited the Pritchard family who still lived at 30 East Drive 10 years later where the phenomena took place. He talked to various relatives, friends, neighbours, the vicar um, and even the local MP, all of whom who had wit witnessed some happenings at the house and had decided to investigate further. Um, <clears throat> much of the rest of this episode comes from investigations from Colin Wilson who contacted the, the historian and it includes a large, a large portion of his book, Poltergeist, a classic study in destructive haunting, um, is about the, the address. So a lot of the sources, that's where it's come from. Cool. Um, so all that history we talked about is 1,500 feet from where the house now sits. Um, right. And the estate, the Checkerfield estate, was built um, on the hilltop opposite the castle um which was once the site of the gallows so it was the castle or the priory that was destroyed oh uh they're both destroyed <laughs> they're both destroyed right? yeah, yeah so but i mean the castle walls are still there you can still go and visit um, yeah. it's it's still plainly visible uh, and the 30 east drive itself is a bit of a weird address it sits at the end it sits on a roundabout and a crossroads between east drive and checkerfield road and they're all um, semi-detached houses so pairs of semi-detached houses the weird one about this one is that uh, it's like the end cap for both streets and 30 East Drive is attached to the last house on Checkerfield Road um, so they're, next, they're adjoined next door neighbours aren't on the same street um, so it was built in the 60s and it was reported that they were the last two houses built on the street the reason being that they sit above an ancient well and a portion of wall which needed to be removed and the well capped off before the ho the houses could be built. So it's like they saved the most difficult one, the ones until last. Yeah. yeah, it's like the classic thing, isn't it? You either do the easy jobs first and then, or the hard jobs first and you've got a nice easy jobs to do at the end, isn't it? Whereas they've just done the opposite way and just saved the worst thing to do for last. It's my favorite but, saying, whenever anything difficult comes up, that's a future. Future problem. problem, yeah. yeah. Tomorrow, Sophie, that one. Yeah. So geography and history concluded now. We can get into some of the haunting. Um, so, 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 Craig, you said that this gave you nightmares. I remember a few years back you said that you, when you read The Shine and that also gave you nightmares. So on, on a scale, which one beats out? Uh, so so the, oh, shi poor little Craig, <laughs> the Shining nightmares. didn't give me nightmares. The, the Shining made me sleepwalk. And it gave Rhea nightmares because she'd wake up and I'd be stood at the end of the bed. <laughs> Just like stood looking at her. Um... Holding an axe and staring out like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Here's Craigie. <laughs> um, so this, I think the thing, so a lot of this I was reading in bed on my Kindle. And, um, and then, so the book itself has various, uh, the Bill Bungie book has various qr codes and then it takes you to the site and you can see there's lots of recordings that people have done when they've stayed on vigils cool. overnight um and it's like you know stuff just falling down the stairs and people having marbles thrown at them and stuff like that and i think it's just the the collective all of that stuff reading about everything and then and then immediately turning my bright kindle off and going to sleep in the dark room is probably what did it yeah um, so i don't know it's not as frightening to me i, I would like to stay there um so yeah are you up for it sean i think so i think so i'll be absolutely terrible but yeah <laughs> we i know we need to find that audio of you doing the um the zombie apocalypse thing Fuck it. you and weren't I, even there <laughs> i know but i heard it and i was like who is that girl screaming and sean was like yeah that was, that semua, was semua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah who is that old lady screaming that would be sure. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what they said at the end. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, much of this account, like I said, is from Colin Wilson, who was an author who wrote books on true crime, mysticism, and the paranormal. Um, he investigated a lot of events from the 60s and witnesses involved. And sadly, he died in 2013, aged 82. Um, 
but a lot of the movie and everything was founded on it and a lot of what we know today is, is his accounts and his right his collections um so the very first event uh with the pritchard family was in august 1966 so were the Pritchards the first people to have moved into that house? Yes, I think so. Um, so they waited for this house to be finished and, and moved in. Um, and it is, it's is—it's quite a big, when you look at it, it's quite a big house. It's got, I think it's three bedrooms, but it's got like a, um, like a porch on the side. It, it's quite a big, um, a big property. And I think it, especially for like yeah. the 60s, it would have been a, a well sought after house. Yeah. Um, and at the time they they lived there, um, the the family consisted of Jean and Joe Pritchard, their son Philip, aged fifteen, and their daughter Diane, aged twelve. Um, it was a bank holiday, and the family had gone on holiday to Devon, leaving Jean's mother Sarah Scholes in charge of the house and looking after fifteen-year-old Philip, who didn't want to go. So he didn't want to go to Devon with his family. <laughs> he's a little like, bastard. Well, I mean, he's fifteen, isn't it? You don't want to, unless you're Sophie. When you get to like twelve, you don't want to go. You don't, you don't want to go on holiday with your mum and dad anymore, do you? Yeah, I'm the goose to this day. It's come on, mummy. Come on, daddy. <laughs> let's go. It's time for holidays. <laughs> um, so Imagine me like wriggling in between them on the sofa. What are we watching tonight, guys? <laughs> <laughs> your dad being like, oh, "What a cock block." <laughs> uh, <laughs> The scariest sentence that you'd say tonight is that to Sophie. I know. Yes. Really? Stop thinking about your dad's willy, Sophie. You're weird. <laughs> Can you stop thinking about my dad's willy, please? I can't stop thinking. I can't. His name's, his name's Mick. Well, it must be magnificent. <laughs> I'm sure um, my dad would not like that to be aired out on, to, uh, to, the, to the masses. Oh, we can edit that out. We can leave the bit about it being magnificent, I think. Yeah, he'll probably, he'll probably like that bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it was a sunny day and Philip was reading a book outside in the garden and his grandmother, Sarah, was sat on the settee knitting when a sudden gust of wind rattled at the windows and made the door slam. Philip rushed into the house to see what the noise was and when Sarah had asked him where, if the wind was getting up outside, he said, no, it's completely calm. Um, he went in the kitchen to make a cup of tea and as he fetched the cup through from the kitchen he saw white powder like chalk dust floating all around his grandmother who was too engrossed in her knitting to even notice it. She was just off her tits on cocaine That's doing it. something. <laughs> it was going everywhere. Just covered in emotion. <laughs> it, was, it was in her whiskers. Uh, <laughs> so she finally did notice and when they both looked up the ceiling, at the ceiling it seemed to be like a clear buffer of air between uh, the ceiling and where the dust started. So it was like dust that was forming on the roof that wasn't there. Um, so it was just below his head and it was cast cascading down from this point and down to the floor. So the, the pair weren't really alarmed at this point, but it was the start of a series of events that would come to define the address as one of the most haunted places in the world. In the world? In the yep, world. In the world. Wow. So this mm -hmm. particular... This particular event is corroborated by Sarah's other daughter, Marie, who lived opposite. Uh, you'll find out that they all pretty much lived on top of each other, um, you know, over the road, next door, various. Um, but, I, I mean, it's a mining town in the north. That's pretty much how all of our families lived. Yeah. Uh, so she, uh, her daughter Marie lived over the road. Sarah popped over and brought Marie back, and she was astonished to find her mother... <laughs> when she knocked on the door looking like a snowman <laughs> um so she popped the car out your face <laughs> yeah. um she popped over the road to find the powder was still falling with no apparent source and everything in the room was covered in white f in a white film and a large puddle of water was forming on the linone lino linoleum in the kitchen <laughs> linoleum. <laughs> linoleum. um so weird did it ever any idea what that would be that powder um no I, no actually i don't don't think they ever got it analyzed or anything like that but no just cleaned it up and cracked on um but the water did worry them they thought it might be rising from under the linoleum lino, the linoleum, <laughs> linoleum it's my defeating word linoleum yeah. so they lifted it up to find that it was completely bone dry underneath 
But as they mm-hmm. mopped each patch up, another one would appear. Uh, and when they were asked about it, they were perfect circles. Um, it's, cre- it's creepy finding perfect shapes on seemingly natural occurrences. Yeah, and this yeah, and no source of them. That, you know, the, the ceilings mm. were, were dry, the walls were dry, and under under, under the from... linoleum was was dry as well. <laughs> so, but uh, over the years, various other things would happen with water in the house. So, when the kitchen tap was turned on, green fo- green foam would spill out, or the toilet would flush upstairs. So you turn the tap on in the in the kitchen, and upstairs <laughs> the toilet would flush. That uh, sounds like, like the guys. Who... <laughs> so go on, sorry. No, you go. What does it sound like to you? I was going to say, it just sounds like they really made a half-assed attempt in this house they didn't want to build. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it sounds like Joe's done the DIY, Joe being my boyfriend. <laughs> has done the DIY for all them. Um, so on this particular occasion with the thing, with uh, Joe, on one, no, on this occasion, the next door neighbour, Enid Pritchard, who was married to Joe Pritchard's brother, so that was Philip and Dean's auntie, Diane's auntie, sorry. <laughs> so... Yeah, um, she turned the she came round to turn the water supply off at the stopcock and phoned the water board, um, but the puddles still kept appearing. Uh, by the time the water board arrived, the powder had stopped falling and the puddles had disappeared. The water board concluded that there were no burst pipes and nothing wrong with the drains and suggested it was condensation, even though it was one of the driest weekends on record. Um, and then they left. So later that evening, after they all got cleaned up, it started happening again. Uh, but this time the kitchen surface also seemed to be covered in sugar and dry tea leaves. Uh, Philip, <laughs> Philip and Sarah... Sounds like oh, Philip made a mess sense. making that cup of tea. He, he did, yeah. But Philip and Sarah then... So they were back. They were on their own. Again, Philip and, and Granny Sarah. They went into the kitchen and they watched in dismay as the tea dispenser in the kitchen started operating itself with the button being pressed gently in and out and tea just cascading all over the side with nobody anywhere Ooh. near the device. I don't like the thought of it being gently in and out. Know, like right. just. Oh. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like this, Sarah? Do you like this? How Look at you? all your tea. Look at all your tea. <laughs> it's I'm a messy boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as Philip tried to stop the device decanting its contents, there was a massive crash in the hallway, and as they both rushed, so they've gone through the kitchen, through the living room, and into the hallway. Uh, and as they get there, they find absolutely nothing there. Um, but as they stood looking around to see what the noise was, the hallway light went off by the switch. <laughs> oh. Next to them, like... It's, uh... Was it slowly as well? <laughs> Time to take, turn the lights off, Sarah. Get yourself more comfy. Um, so they both startled. They look up the stairs to find out at what had made the noise and a plant which normally stood at the bottom of the stairs was now halfway up the stairs <laughs> minus How the did you get up there? <laughs> minus the pot which was at the top <laughs> so somebody had basically taken the plant out of the pot shoved it halfway up the stairs and left the pot at the top um another noise That's made them run going. into the kitchen to find the crockery cupboard was shaking violently as soon as philip opened the cupboard door the vibration stopped banging started elsewhere in the house and so the pair left the house and went to fetch Auntie Marie again over the road. Neither of them wanted to be left alone in 30 East Drive. Yeah, definitely. No. Although, Auntie Marie sounds like she's a bit hench. She knows what she's doing. She's like, fucking pussies. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marching back. Um, so on the other side, the non-conjoining house that is on um, on East Drive, that they went round there to see if they could hear the noise. Uh, the neighbour said, no, it, it wasn't me. I thought you were doing some carpentry next door and we heard the noises as well. <laughs> so all of the banging and, and rattling and stuff, the next door neighbours that weren't joined could, heard, hear. could hear it, yeah. Um, so eventually Philip and his grandmother tried to get settled for the night. Philip went up to bed and as Sarah went to kiss him goodnight, she realised he was looking up over her shoulder in absolute horror. Oh no, 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 I don't like it, no. <laughs> was, it, was it his nightgown on his ensuite door? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me it wasn't. Say like it so. I like that it's now a nightgown. So now I'm imagining <laughs> Craig in a nighty. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's Chrissy floral night. Um, Valor. Like a moon, though. <laughs> uh, she turned to find the wardrobe door dancing, the wardrobe dancing and tottering like a drunk man. 
She told Philip to get dressed, and and they left, and they spent the night at Auntie Marie's. Why? Why didn't he have clothes on? Anyway? Why was he naked? Why was he naked? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe he had pajamas on. There's definitely a presence in this house. I'm gonna get naked. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bit weird as well. I can't imagine being put to bed put to bed by my grandma at fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like. He's too- to go on holiday with his parents, but he's not old enough to be tucked in by his nan. To be fair, <laughs> if it was a haunted house, yeah. I would be like, will you, will you take me to bed, please? <laughs> Just took, took me in and get in. <laughs> <laughs> um... I don't know, my grandma's tiny, I would absolutely I'd just roll over in the night and, and she'd inspire. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, oh man, squash grandma. Um <laughs> The poltergeist did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so they went and stayed at uh, Auntie Mary or Marie, Marie's house. Uh Marie was not content to let the issue lie. She phoned the police and as the police came out that night to investigate, three officers mm-hmm. Three officers in total explored the house, and then an inspector named Taylor reminded Marie of her friend, Mr. O'Donnell, who had an interest in the paranormal. So although it was mo- almost midnight, they walked up the street to, in- to observe that Mr. O'Donnell was still awake, and they knocked on his door, and without hesitation, Mr. O'Donnell went to visit the house. So this is the same night. He was still awake, he was like, I've been expecting you. <laughs> yes. yes it, but I don't get it, it's like, some, something spooky is going on. The police and are like... It, it, it takes a policeman to remind you that you have a friend. <laughs> yeah. you got a friend. And... You've got I, a friend I, that is interested in ghosts. You're not going to Oh, no. You can imagine the coppers like? as well in, like, West Yorkshire in the 60s being like, <laughs> yeah, what, what, okay, Sarah, maybe you should go speak to <laughs> your mate or, or Donald. Yeah. Um, but three of them went out anyway. It must have been a slow day. It must have been, yeah. Um. So as O'Donnell entered the house, he was met by a blast of cold air. But other than that, nothing really happened for the next hour and a half. It was approaching 1.45 a.m. and Mr. O'Donnell retired for the night. In a passing comment, he mentioned that poltergeists do funny things like tear your photographs in half. And as he went to open the door, they heard a crash upstairs to find a smashed wedding photo of Jean and Joe Pritchard with the print torn perfectly in half. Um, Ooh. apparently the poltergeist was listening. <laughs> That's it, it must have been. No, he's, he? up, he's certainly not deaf. Yeah. So two years after this pass with very little incident, um, Philip left school and went to work in his father's pet shop and Diane had turned into a pretty blonde teenager. Uh, Granny Sarah was no... was uh, She was... She was now 72 and she spent most weekends with the Pritchards and sometimes recanted the bank holiday event, which Joe Pritchard found very tiresome. Because obviously they were down <laughs> in Devon at the time. He's like, hey. yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine him being like, your mother is a dickhead. <laughs> but, but like, if, imagine them being like, and then the photo was torn in half. They'd be like, oh, <laughs> yeah. the photo was torn in half. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> Oh, there was tea everywhere. What a nightmare. Yeah. So um, events start to pick up again. And a lot of uh, belief around poltergeists is that it happens around puberty. So first time it happened was um, the Philip was 15 15. at the time. It starts happening again when Diane reaches puberty. Yeah. She's she's 14, 15 now. Yeah. Um, so creep. I know, yeah. So a, cu- a couple of years on, um, Jean uh, decides to redecorate Diane's bedroom. Halfway through, she decides to go and make a cup of tea, which she drank with her mother Sarah downstairs in the kitchen. Uh, Sarah shows alarm at a noise she's heard, and when Jean goes back up to investigate, she finds Diane's bed thrown at the bottom of the stairs. So somebody's no. thrown a bed downstairs. Uh, sorry, her throw. Uh, so, Jenna, oh. not her bed, her throw. Yeah, I was like, yeah, that's a bit much. Yeah, sorry, a throw. Um, she takes the throw right. back upstairs, puts it back on the bed, starts decorating again. Here's another crash, and as she goes to the landing, um, Philip's throw is now at the bottom of the bed, uh, at the bottom of the stairs. Her mother's still in the kitchen, and she's the only other person in the house. Mm. So both of them are downstairs when Diane's throw is thrown down the stairs. 
She goes back upstairs, takes it up, starts decorating again, and then Philip's throat is thrown downstairs whilst right. whilst Sarah's upstairs. Um, the noise that made the original uh, that made by the fall, uh, the noise was made by the fall of plant pots, which are upended on the carpet and the soil everywhere. Uh, she mush- rushes downstairs to find her mother crying. It's starting again. Uh, <laughs> what a creepy ghost. I know, yeah. Um, that night, Jean's struggling to sleep. Joe is fast asleep next to her. <laughs> Obviously, like, whatever. Like, just snoring. <laughs> um, and next to her, she noticed, noticed something moving on the landing outside of the room. She switches on the landing light, and as she does, a paintbrush flies past her face, barely missing, followed by a paste bucket which hits the wall, landing, scattering paste all over the carpet. Oh, you know why I would be fucking fuming. <laughs> what, after you finish? Paste on the carpet. Oh. So in the dim light, she sees the movement that originally caught her attention. It's a previously rolled up piece of wallpaper that's now swaying like a cobra. So it reminds me of Beetlejuice, this. As she grabs for it, yeah, yeah. it just flutters for the floor. And at the same time, a carpet sweeper flies up into the air and swings around like a club. Jean, terrified, crawls on all fours back into the bedroom and slams the door just as a roll of wallpaper hits the door behind her. She screams, waking Joe up and the children. And as the, full, the whole family huddles together, paintbrushes and materials start to fly all around them. The ac- oh, wow. The activity Jeez. seems to move from the landing into Diane's bedroom, where a wooden pelmet that there's nothing like this is proper 60s isn't it a wooden pelmet is torn from the wall and flies into the window to hit the path what's a what's a pelmet it's a helmet for a pee um, oh right <laughs> no it's not it's the bit cool. it's the bit that goes around the top of the window like it's like a it's like a curtain for your curtain you oh must, right okay you must have seen them on like in old people's homes and stuff you get that yeah. tiny little bit of curtain that goes around the top of the curtain mm-hmm. that's a pelmet but this one's a wooden helmet right. that's sort of fixed in. It's torn off and th- and it, it ends up being dumped in the street outside the house. Um, that night, the kids spend the night in the parents' room, locking the door in a completely pointless measure to make themselves feel at ease. Yeah, that's why I was terrified of ghosts as a kid, because they don't give a toss about the doors closed or locked or whatever. They just walk through it. Yeah. So... Um, I think the thing for me though is, it's. I mean, it's all family and friends of family that there's. At this point, there's not really anyone else to sort of verify it. Well, the neighbours corroborated the the noises, the noises and point. stuff. Yeah. Um, and the uh, and the spooky neighbour that came and then the picture was torn. He just came along to give my the poltergeist ideas. It so that's a research session. <laughs> it's. Um, it's interesting though because Bill Bungay is a, a massive skeptic, and he's had a few creepy things occur. So when people send him messages and stuff, he tries to give them um, reasons grounded in reality of why that might have right, been a yeah. thing. Um, but he's had a few things, and he won't stay there himself anymore. So he's like, "Oh really?" Yeah. So he's still, I, I think he's still a skeptic, but there's stuff that he can't really explain that's happened to him as well. And you look on the so website, she- there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of accounts of weird stuff um so over the next nine months the family are are harassed by this unseen lodger they christen him fred to make him a little less terrifying but he constantly i don't know fred fred west oh fred west hasn't hasn't made himself known yet has he 66 uh no um he constantly bangs around the house throws ornaments turns lights on and off but it only seems to happen when diane's home Right. Okay. And how old? How old is Diane at this point? She's an early, 14, early, 15. early teenager. I think maybe thirteen. I am uncomfy. <laughs> so, enough is enough. And Auntie Marie and her husband Vic contact the local vicar, Reverend Davy, to uh, exercise the spirit. Reverend... I'm absolutely loving Auntie Marie. <laughs> She's just like I've taken no shit from this. Absolutely. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um. So Reverend Davy visits the house and after an hour of conversation, Fred had been on his best behaviour. Reverend Davy's about to leave and then a load of thumps sounded throughout the house and a brass candelabra dropped from the mantelpiece. Reverend Davy writes off the event to subsidence and in an act of pure defiance, the one remaining candlestick from the mantelpiece rises up, floats across the room to almost touch the vicar's nose and then drops to the floor right in front of them. Just <laughs> as, if the, as if Fred's going... 
whatever dickhead watch this. That's it. Subside this, you <laughs> bastard. Exactly, yeah. Fred is sassy, isn't he? Yeah. is, isn't he? And just as the candle drops, there's a crash in the room next door. They all rush into the lounge to find that every cup, sauce, saucer and plate from the china cupboard is all over the carpet without a single one broken. Um, Reverend... Yeah, that, but, but the pot guy's just really pissed off at that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reverend Davy didn't believe it was subsidence anymore. <laughs> oh shit yeah. uh, he told the family to move at this point he's gone from it's subsidence to you need to move Get because out. something evil is in this house um, Joe, and G, Joe and Jean aren't going to move they'd waited for this house to be built and Joe is a bit of a tough cookie and he's absolutely not frightened by a ghost sounds like a classic man of his generation then he does yeah um, <laughs> Reverend Davy leaves and as Diane's heading upstairs a large shadow appears on the wall the air yeah. turns icy and a heavy oak stand floated up the air and pressed her down with even with a sewing machine on top. Um, every So she's flattened to the stairs by an oak stand with a sewing machine on top. And as everyone tries to pull the, sand off, the, the stand and electric sewing machine off her, they can't. And it's not until Diane starts to chill out and relax that the weight lifts um, and they can pull it away. So she's lying face down, flattened to the stairs by something, pressing an oak stand against her. Um, that night they put Diane to bed and no sooner had Jean left the room that Diane's sheets were pulled off of her, her mattress raised into the air and she was dumped unceremoniously to the floor. The same thing happened four more times that night. Oh, bitch. Christ. Yeah. So she's definitely... Have a like, nice sleep. She's the focus of all the activity. Yeah, Definitely. Um, in September 1968, two reporters came to call from two local pa papers. Uh, the press reported the incident as the Pontefract Poltergeist is back in the Yorkshire Evening Post. And the Pontefract and Castleford Express announced that invisible hands rock the family. <laughs> well, um, the house becomes a bit of a, like a local attraction for ghost hunters and... Even, they even hear one day as the uh, the bus the, the bus stop outside the house they hear the bus the bus driver every time he stops there say that's the haunted house. Oh, that's <laughs> the one. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, the, the students one day a load of students from Leeds get off the bus and try to camp in Mrs. Pritchard's front garden. Cheeky bastards. <laughs> I know, yeah. She turfs them out and they end up sleeping on the grass verge, which is just literally in front of their garden. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're going to call, don't you? Auntie yeah. Marie. Auntie Marie, I'll sort those guys out in no time. Absolutely. All night, um, Fred obliges their um, observing the house by crashing, banging and turning the lights on and off all night So long. he's a bit of a showman, is our yes. Fred? Oh, you he want is. a show? Yeah, stop, that stop. was me being uh, Fred shimming his shoulders. <laughs> Watch what I do with this candle. <laughs> <laughs> um, regularly, apparently, miners listen to the phantom drumming, drumming on their morning walk to work. So basically, as miners are walking to work, Fred gives them a little bit of a show every morning. Jesus, um, little prick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, if you want to stay there, Sean. Maybe don't call him a prick. He's not on, he's not on, the, he's not on the internet, is he? He's our Fred. We don't know. Right. Maybe he is. Maybe he's watching if right now. If he likes now. To, to hang around with girls just going into their puberty, he's probably, he's, on, he's probably on TikTok. He's, he's probably TikTok. seen a, twi a few Twitch videos. At least. Yeah, shit. Sorry, Fred. Please forgive me. <laughs> it's all right. I don't think you'd be his type. No. Um, Could be. A local psychic speaks to Jean, tells her she's not afraid. I ain't afraid of no ghost. Um, <laughs> and, she, and she spends the next nine months pretty much living in 30 East Drive um, while she's there. So her name's Mrs. Holden the Psychic. While she's there, she witnesses lights being switched on and off, blasts of air, tapping, crashes, and constant items being thrown around the house. She also witnesses bites being taken out of sandwiches and being thrown behind oh, the right. table. This is the last straw. <laughs> I know, yeah. Do anything but my cheese and pickle sandwich. <laughs> it's, it's a line too far. A crab paste, wouldn't it? The 60s would be like a paste or something. Uh, yeah. Crab paste. All right, you can have a bite. <laughs> <laughs> Take a big one. So, yeah. Um, and the 
the black monk seems to really like smacking her in the face with a cushion. <laughs> it's like it's, <laughs> teenage it, girl. No, the um, uh, Mrs. Holden, the psychic. He likes. Okay, him. that's good because I was going to call him a kinky bitch, and then I was like, I can't say that about a paedophile ghost. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, so what is her actual purpose there? Just to get free room and board. And, and the show. It sounds like. Is that what it's for? <laughs> so that's the thing in it. She's like, oh, he's eating my sandwich. Will you make me another one, please? <laughs> she's like that. <laughs> oh, Fred's eating all my sandwich again. Fred, Fred tells me he's tired of crab paste. Can I have some cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Fred really wants some hobnobs. Have you got any hobnobs? <laughs> um, so, yeah, she sandwiches being beaten uh, <laughs> i was so, like well, so yeah, yeah, yeah sandwiches, sandwiches yeah <laughs> so one night mrs holden suggests a sort of seance seance and invites the pritchards to hold hands at the bottom of the stairs to see if the spirit would manifest itself why did she do that on day one i know yeah <laughs> well she, she's she like, was hungry oh. yeah she's like yeah i am getting bored of these sandwiches now let's sort this out yeah, right. um, Meanwhile, she's like this big, size the house. Yeah, has, just, has to waddle from room to room. I best, I best do this in the landing now before I don't fit in it anymore. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, to see if the spirit had man manifest itself, it didn't take long before it did precisely that. So they stood at the bottom of the stairs, holding hands. The sound of loud wind starts rushing down the stairs. And a shower of objects, including bedding, boxes, ornaments, mattresses, and anything that basically was upstairs, started being flung down them. Um, and that was it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the... <laughs> I, thought was, I thought that was the end of the story for a second. No, no, like, not, no. Sorry, guys. Strong finish, Craig. Um, <laughs> and that's it. So there's another uh, like big witness to this, Aunt Maud, so Joe's sister Maud who is a massive sceptic and she's not impressed with the like local celebrity that the family are getting. People are saying, oh, you know, what's happening at your Joe's house and stuff? And she's like, I'm sick of this shit. I'm going to go mm. and stay and tell everybody it's absolute nonsense. Um, it's, it's Aunt Maud, like Aunt Marie, but like to the nth degree. Yeah, it's, this one's, um, so yeah, Joe's sister. And she's like, nah, you're, uh, you're full of shit. You just want free pints and cool. stuff in the club. <laughs> um, so she sat in, in the kitchen in 30 East Drive, telling Jean how indignant she is about the stories around the neighbourhood. And just as she's telling her that, all the lights go go out, the fridge drawer opens, and a bottle of milk floats from the fridge, completely dousing her in the milk <laughs> from head to toe. Um, <laughs> Take that, you bitch. Maud it's almost, not real now. Well, she's still unconvinced. Um, she, she says it's the kids. Um... And so Jean says, you know what, you just need to spend the night, just spend a night or two with us. So Maud agrees to this, and as she does, um, so she agrees to this, and as she says, yeah, I'm going to agree to this, the entire rest of the contents of the fridge spill out all around her feet, all the chairs are flung over, and the electric fire is pulled out of the fireplace, um, and the lights are quickly turned back on, all within a couple of a seconds of her saying, yeah, I'll stay tonight. Kids. <laughs> uh, never mind. Um, I changed my mind. So the spirit's okay. happy now. He's you know he's proved his point. But so the rest of the evening, nothing else happens. So it's completely without incident. Um, that is until they go to bed. Jean, Diane, and Aunt Maud move into Philip's room. Philip goes into Diane's room, and Joe stays in his own bed. Classic Joe. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, whatever. Uh, Jean... my Grandma. <laughs> Grandma, come here. There's a space for you. <laughs> um, Jean had literally just got into bed before the reading lamp slowly sailed across the room and out of the door. <laughs> <It's just> like... <laughs> I'm having that. <laughs> <Yeah>. Swag. <laughs> yeah. um, two of the bulbs from the downstairs electric fire were now dancing around the top of the door upstairs and two at the bottom and then they saw a pair of hands Oh, oh no, mm -mm. Um, I don't like right seeing like objects floating about. I can make a joke about, but as soon as you start yeah. seeing figures or stuff like that, I'm like, yeah, no, same. no, well, uh, uh, no, wait, thank you. Wait till I show you the pictures later. Oh. Um, <laughs> one hand appeared at the top of the door frame, and another no. at the oh, bottom, Christ. as no, if thank you. as if a set of jaws. So if the per if it was an actual person wearing them, the arm span would have been well over six feet. No, thank you. Um, Maud wow. shouted 
and it appeared that it was actually Maud's gloves. She oh. So she saw them. She said, get away, you're evil. She flung her boots, which were beside the bed, at the door, and everything sort of flattened and vanished. She didn't think the kids were doing this anymore. Um, Funny enough, yeah. When she left the next morning... She... That, that seems like something that the kids would be most able to do. So she's yeah. laid in bed. You get one glove, I get the other. Well, one, like of, the... one of the kids is in bed with her, next next to her. Ah, uh, all right, never mind. Um, so Diane's next to her in bed. So it's definitely not Diane. It could be um, Philip and Joe just taking the piss, going, let's frighten the shit. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't think Joe's got a sense of humour at all. <laughs> no. I think he's a very dour, serious, stuck in his ways man. I don't think he's one for for japes and such. So yeah. Joe, Joe did actually die in the house eventually. Um, he died in the bathroom upstairs. Um, uh, of what? By the ghost? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, this is long, long, long after the, the bulk of events. Um, okay. But he also had, they had... They call it the call house, but I'm from the northeast. The call house is outside. There's it's fancy. It's inside. So in the hallway, there's a, there's, there's a little there's a call house. Uh, but he did have an experience in the call house that absolutely scared the shit out of him. Where um, the door slammed, locked behind him. He couldn't get it open, and he never really did talk about it. But um, yeah, it was. He he eventually became a bit of a believer. Um, Grudge dragged into believing in Fred. Yeah, absolutely. Just like uh, super skeptic, his sister Maud, when she left the next yeah. morning, she vowed never to stay there, stay in the house again, and she couldn't find her gloves anywhere. So it's like <laughs> Fred was like, "That'll teach." Yeah, you. I'm having them. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine Fred. Fred. Eventually, <laughs> eventually, Joe did find her gloves in the call house. Um, she, he took them back round to her house, but rather than touch them, she held them with barbecue tongs, burnt them with paraffin in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was imagining Fred like looking in the mirror with the gloves on, like, ooh, fancy, ooh. You know, as soon as you said that, I imagined uh, Buffalo Bill be like, I'd fuck me. Well, <laughs> it's like yeah. every time. <laughs> every single yeah. time, yeah. But like, like looking at him with like sniffing the gloves, like, oh, I'm so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now Sean like is licking his hand. <laughs> Washing himself like a cat. <laughs> yeah. But it does, so Fred is also, he is a, well, we've already seen he's a bit of a practical joker. Um, and over the following months, he smears jam all over the bedroom door handles. He, he smashes could eggs. Could be worse things to smear all over the uh, the handles. It could be. He, um, he likes to smash eggs in front of the family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he constantly empties the tea and sugar. Um, he likes to throw mustard, marmalade and toilet paper downstairs. He likes to turn. Why is why is marmalade up the stairs? I have no idea. <laughs> Craig, in your so, research, like could, a... you, could you tell us why there was mustard and marmalade up the stairs? It sounds like a form of etiquette, doesn't it? It's like it's it's certain things down the stairs, certain things up the stairs. Don't throw marmalade down the stairs. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. <laughs> Unless the parents were uh, bringing food into the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Although sure. mustard, mustard isn't something that you'd want to smear all over your private parts. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe like maybe. a sensation. <laughs> Joe's got a very particular niche. Yeah, I like likes. it to burn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the other things he does, which is um, a particular talent, is he turns the visitors' car window wipers on and off while the car's locked. So many visitors to the house, their window wipers go on, the car's locked, and they have to unlock the car, get in it to turn the window wipers off. Um, it's strange because all these all these little occurrences aren't in the, in of themselves. Or if you take them individually, are quite minimal in terms of impact. It just feels like like crap practical jokes. Yeah. Well, it, um, it is exactly that. Everybody who goes to the house loses personal items. Um, one day, Jean is looking... Uh, she's cleaning the chimney... Uh, she's cleaning the fireplace out and 19 keys drop out of the chimney breast. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm just like did. there in the background like, ooh, I can explain. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally... 18 keys that belong to the house, so every key for every lock in the house and one strange one <laughs> that she'd never seen before. And she's, she... Oh, those. Oh, they're just my key collection. <laughs> so 18 Even keys... ghosts have to have a hobby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the one thing that is really disturbing are the sm there are smells, um, animal noises, and really vicious, loud, like bestial grunts. 
and a lot of the so, footage from the house now is full of grunts. Do you remember, Craig, in the first episode when we had you doing the sound effects? <laughs> oh, God. I just wondered if you could help us, because I, I really, I'm struggling I to remember. Either. Yeah, I'm struggling to imagine, like, what an <laughs> animal sounds like uh, with, like, a grunt as well. So yeah, yeah. it would just really help me and the listeners. Be like, Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it will. I don't think it will. Come on, now, animal grunt. When you watch the videos, I'm I'm going to try and be serious. When they've watched the videos of people that have stayed, they'll be chatting and stuff, and then you'll literally hear like, <laughs> and they're like, and people literally shit their pants. <laughs> they're like, oh, literally. Oh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, Was that the grunt preceding the shit? It is preceding. <laughs> the... <laughs> well, it, it may be the grunt preceding the smells. <laughs> um. It also seems that Fred doesn't really respect any boundaries. The adjoining neighbours often report seeing Fred and um, experiencing some of the phenomena, but it, it's never as intensely as what the Pritchards got. Um, so one day, Mrs. May Mountain, who lived next door, what a name. May Mountain? May Mountain. <laughs> like a wrestler. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, she was washing the dishes in the sink when she felt somebody behind her. She assumed it was her nephew and told him to give over before looking around and a tall figure dressed in a black monk's habit was looking back at her. No. Nope. Yeah. Sure. I'm free. <laughs> She's like, got nah. any marmalade? <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or mustard, not fussy. <laughs> um... Mrs. Got any man. <laughs> Mrs. May also often experienced the banging and drumming in the night. Lucky me. <laughs> Lucky May found it, didn't it? I experienced a bit of banging and drumming in the night. Tonight. <laughs> um, at various points, the Pritchards have noticed also have noted also seeing a robed figure on the landing of their house upstairs. No. <laughs> um, it is believed that the house is haunted by this entity and a young girl called emma who actually people have heard and have recorded there is a oh, really shit. creepy um clip of everybody's upstairs in the house on a vigil and there's a, a camera left recording outside the call house and you hear a girl giggle she literally goes he don't go in there <laughs> no like, yeah it's that sort of stuff that i was like looking on the book and then um, and then and then going to sleep immediately after so, so for me, it, like you say, you don't. You're you're a skeptic. I'm kind of like on the fence. Some some stories I'm like I believe. Same. Some stories I'm like what shit. Yeah. Um. But the ones that I don't like the most are about children and like really really old people. So there to be a little girl giggling yeah. is even creepier than Fred with his mustard. So there's yeah. There's, there's like um they've done. So Bill Bunger, he's like, the one rule is no Ouija boards. If you stay, no Ouija boards. You can do seances and whatever you want, but he's like, I just don't like them. They're creepy. Um, so don't do them. But For a skeptic, he's got an awful lot of rules of what you know, It's like, as a skeptic, I've got, I think I don't allow these certain things because he's, he's got they quite, make a question myself. Basically, the woman that lives next door, who still reports regular weird stuff happening all the time. It's still me mountain. No, uh, I can't remember her name. But she right. basically k takes care of the house and looks after it. So when guests have come, right. she'll go clean up and stuff like that. And a lot of the stuff he does, I think, is out of respect for her. So he doesn't right. want he doesn't yeah. want any rowdy parties or anything like that. He doesn't want a lot of noise. Um, and she basically reports back if there've been knobheads in the house. Uh, so I'm sure, you could just say that was Fred and then move on. <laughs> Some of the people, um, I mean, there's a lot of people that have stayed in the house have report have. Um, one guy was lying, just lying completely still, uh, woke up in complete agony, um, went to the hospital and he had two cracked ribs <laughs> from lying still. There's Fred's evolved. Regularly, hey. women mm. report um, feeling like somebody is grabbing their ankles and they end up with bruised finger marks all around their ankles. Um. Uh, and that happens regularly and there's loads of photos. Um, this is now. This isn't in the sixties. This is like. So he's forty years is fifty years is embittered, Fred. Then seventy years. Sorry, seventy years. Is 60s. Well, I mean, if he if he was a monk from Henry VIII's time, he's he's, he's got a good five hundred years of being bored shitless, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he suddenly, suddenly the mustard doesn't cut it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, now as well with lockdown, he's going to be extra bored, isn't he? Oh, <laughs> she's going to be experiencing a lot of banging and drumming in the night next door, isn't it? Where's the financial assistance for the uh, the poltergeist of the country, eh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so at this point, you know, the family are absolutely sick of it. Vic, the brother-in-law to Joan Mary, um, who lived over the road with Marie, asked. He's he's Catholic. The rest of the family are Protestants. Um, he then says, I'm going to ask my own Catholic priest about exorcism because obviously your vicar wasn't that arsed. Um, he's more willing... Did you tell him to leave? Oh, yeah, he did. He did tell him <laughs> to like, leave. But also, I am leaving now and never coming back. Yeah, so I advise you to do what I'm doing. I'm fucking off. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the Catholic priest is a little bit more willing than his Church of England counterpart. Just uh, more Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I almost said a joke about. <laughs> I almost did a Nancy joke. I won't do Nancy jokes about Catholic priests. <laughs> it's all right. We can imagine. <laughs> um, Insert Nancy joke here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, he suggests a bottle of holy water and saying some fra- some prayers. So going around the house, sprinkle some holy water and say a prayer in each room. Vic takes this bottle of holy water, takes it, suggests it to the family, uh, and the family are like, oh, whatever, give it a go. He wanders all around the house, uh, spreading spreading holy water same prayers and um, just as he gets to the very last room he sprinkles the very last bit in the lounge where most of the activity is and um jean says to him how long do you think it's going to take to work and just as she says it there's a massive crash upstairs and and trickles of water start showering down the walls <laughs> Appar- apparently fred did not give two shits about their holy water he was just like especially Although, if, I- if he was a monk he'd be like seen it Done yeah. it. Wrote yeah. the book. But it seems strange that he, he leaves Drank the room. It, bathed in it. Yeah. Yeah, it seems strange that, he, that the, the room that he's sprinkling last is the one that's received the most. If that was me, I was like, right, I'm going to this one first. I'm going to use it off the wall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that very night, Fred seemed to double down, drumming, throwing furniture, tipping Diana out of bed every two minutes. Oh, um, poor Diana. Until it's five horrible. until five o'clock in the morning when the sun started rising again. Diane, oh, absolutely God. knackered, stays off school the next Bless day to, to recuperate. And as she's brushing her hair, the crucif in the in the living room now, the crucifix from the mantelpiece shot off, flattened to her back, and none of the family could remove it, just like the time she was squashed to the floor with the sewing machine the sewing Fuck. machine stand. I thought the- you were gonna say the crucifix turned upside down. Uh, there is there is some of that as well. Oh. <laughs> By the time it was removed, Diane was left with the shape of a crucifix in her back for over a week before it faded. Oh dear. Yeah. Calm down, Fred. Leave her alone. No, yeah. Yeah, what a bully. But it's like you know what you're gonna bring your holy water in here. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the holy connotations now and start throwing them yeah. back at you. Um, so he's not, not happy with his former religion, is he? Well, on Easter Sunday. Jean comes downstairs to find inverted gold crosses painted on all the doors and walls with considerable precision. Fuck me. Um, so she finds that whoever's done it has used gold spray paint that Philip had bought intended to respray his bicycle and was previously in the outhouse. She tried to recreate some of these crosses and couldn't spray them. They were they were precise. Um It'd like somebody had used a template. She couldn't find a template anywhere in the house or or in the bins. Um, but yeah, somebody had used the entire tin of spray paint, putting upside down crucifixes all around the house on Easter Sunday. Which oh. was, um, it's a, I don't know whether that's a bad taste or a really great sense of humour. I'm a jury's out for me. He said, like him giggling to himself, oh, they're going to love this. They're going to love this. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly seems like he's up in the ante. Um, he is, isn't he? Yeah. This is a fuck you now, isn't it? This is, and this is the very sort of the last, this is the vinegar strokes before his climax. Right, (laughs) Um, okay. So the phenomena reached his climax one evening, uh, not long after this, when Diane had gone into the kitchen to make coffee. All the lights went out, and while Jean was groping for the torch, she heard Diane scream to witness her being dragged the full full length up the stairs by her cardigan whilst seemingly being choked. Oh, no. Philip and Jean grab Diane and try to pull her back down and while she's yelling with terror and suddenly um, 
all of it stops. Diane, uh, Jean and Philip are sent tumbling down the stairs. And after the event, Diane's neck was covered in red finger marks and bruises. Poor girl. Um, it seems that this is the last major event uh, in the house. Um, a few weeks later, they witnessed a full apparition of a monk disappearing through the floor. Um, and then was that where that that wet mark was appearing? Uh, it it was. He did vanish through the kitchen floor, apparently. So possibly. Um, bear in mind, there's a capped well under their house. Oh, uh, of course, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that was the general haunting. Um, so what year was this? This it started in so the it start, 60s. It started in sixty six. Um, and then I'm not sure on the years they didn't really keep diaries or anything. Um, but I think uh, so. Philip had um, left school and was working in the shop. So he was 15 at the time. I'm guessing it's about two or three years later. So late yeah, yeah. 68, 69. <clears throat> um, some, so after 10 years after this, uh, a man with a local interest called Tom Cuniff um, had a local interest and started investigating the events. He was the one to discover about uh, the story of a monk that was hanged at the gallows on the hill um, where the estate is now built. He also found that the point of the house now stood at the site of an old bridge called Priest's Bridge. Um, so he's compared old maps and, and the locations um, and sort of overlaid them. And theirs is the site of a bridge. Um, and his it's his theory that the monk had committed rape and murder and was executed for his crime and haunted the spot where he was hanged and the reasons for the attacks on Diane specifically were sexual in nature. Oh. Um, unfortunately, there's not really a lot to back this up in the local library. Um, it's like a local wives' tale about the monk. There were always monks right. on site. Um, for over 500 years, there were monks living, yeah. working around that area. Um, and in the history, these local monks are very, they're very warlike. Um, they deal a great deal in litigation lots of violence um locally but nothing about a particular rape and murder so i don't right, think yeah. i think the monks were pretty brutal locally um so i mean it's plausible but there's nothing specific I that's, that's something that's evolved over time so he did something horrible but as times moved on to the the the, the height of his crime has evolved to match yeah to the match the, the conditions time. yeah um so, so is it? Um, so, are we saying that, the, that that black monk is now trapped in some sort of spot with Emily, the ghost, as well? Uh, Emma, they call her. Emma, sorry. So there is. Um, there's often a girl <laughs> seen and heard in the house as well. Um, if, if if that's true that he was accused of rape and murder of a, a young girl, and he's trapped in some sort of spiritual space with a young girl. Mm. Uh, yeah, and um, often when the girl is... So the girl is seen as well, quite regularly. And she's been photographed. Um, is she? Yeah, and in a couple of the photos, it looks like she's she's got a, like a mutilated face. Um, oh. So if it, if it is a thing, if it, if it was surreal and she is a manifestation of what happened to her, it was a pretty shitty ending, whatever it was. Yeah. Um. So the conclusion, Colin Wilson's conclusion in his book, um, he sort of concludes that the, he first appears when Richard reaches puberty before disappearing, and then he reappears around the time that Diane reaches puberty and sort of disappears when when um, about the time that it would have been for a brother as well. Um, I'd recommend reading sort of uh, Colin Wilson's book because it's the whole sort of phenomena and the black monk is just one chapter. Um, right, okay. Yeah, you know, I'm still a skeptic. A lot of the people that in this one are close to the like small family circles and friends of family and the people that report it. Um, but there was like a PM. Uh, the thing that makes me less of a skeptic is some of the footage and things that people have taken now. Um, yeah. So he rents. Uh, he rents it out to a paranormal group, one specific paranormal group that kind of host uh, the evenings. And you can sort of, I think it's like 59 or 69 quid. You can spend the evening there. And for a little, for a little bit more, the, you can spend the entire night. 
But what this means is that there are tons and tons of photos, loads of videos. I'm not going to show any, any of the videos or anything now, um, but there are tons and tons of photos on the 30 East Drives website, and we'll put them in the show notes. Um, and uh, we can have a look at some of them now. Are you going to share them, Sophie? Yeah, so uh, for those who are listening on the podcast channels, um, go over to our Instagram. You'll be able to see the photos we're talking about there. For our YouTube and Twitch followers, stick around because we'll be showing you some photos. Um, so our Instagram and yeah, Instagram is at textmepod for those having a look there. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, so this is Pontefract Castle, um, as it would have looked, and at the time, um, at the time of its destruction, was said to be one of the most grand castles in the land. Yeah, it looks amazing. Yeah, um, it's the one in Nesborough Hill. Uh, it was destroyed at a similar time to the one in Nesborough Hill. Um, the one, so uh, remember, I said Richard died there. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard was transferred from the Tower of London to Knaresborough for a stop off and then ultimately into Pontefract. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I so for those, for those listening on the podcast, we're looking at like a big, massive castle. Like it's huge. It's the biggest I've ever seen. Yeah. And it, it's, a, it's a painting of, because it was in the olden times. <laughs> in the olden days. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, the, if to the right of that picture, I'm not sure if that is the Priory or not. Maybe uh, possible, isn't it? Yeah, there is a there is a, a large church still around the front walls. Um, so it may be that church, or it may be the priory. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a Google map. So it shows where the castle is and the priory, um, and where the. Haunting where the case. Aldi is. Uh, yeah, and there's uh, yeah. There's a spa. There's spa. a spa tool station. Tool station. <laughs> the most haunted tool station in the land. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, on the right you can see where the that's Thirty East Drive, and you see the roundabout in front. That's what I. Um, that's like, <laughs> I believe where the stu Leeds students slept that night. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, next slide, please. This is uh, a very rough picture of Emma. Uh, it's better if you actually see it on this, the full picture. Um, but we can see like it's a. Uh, she always appears like that, like a dress in a like. It looks like a bit of a nightgown. Uh, yeah, so we're looking at like a. It's, it's super super blurry, but like a a really grainy photo that looks like the outline of a young girl wearing a dress. You can kind of kind of see like a hand. It looks like it's it's reaching yeah. out a little bit, but it, it's super unclear. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to categorically say that that was a, a, a little girl. No. This next one, however, is... Oh. Um, this is the landing and it's... Uh, oh, fuck me. That's, um, that one's pretty... So yeah, I've had now, now it looks like there's. We're, we're looking at a photo of from inside a room, looking out onto the hallway. So it's dark inside, light on the hallway, and in the in the the figure, there's a figure in the doorway, but like a black smoky figure, like turned to the side, kinda. Yeah. But then also it looks really creepy to the side of that. Like there's some like red eyes or something looking back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this um me. this is looking out of Diane's bedroom onto the landing. Right, okay. Yeah. Kind it of looks like his head might be down in like prayer or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad in prayer. It just reminds me of when when um, my grand's house back in the day. Have you got your own Fred to tell us about? No, 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 just that that kind of that, decor. The, yeah. The vibe. Decor and the the, the um you can... the, uh, the landing and the, that's that must be where the stairs go down and stuff. Just yeah. You can see a, what was it called? A, a pellet? A pelmet. A pelmet, yeah. 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 Um, so this is one from one of the vigils. So there's obviously a guy sat in the chair. But <laughs> looking... So, <laughs> look, so this, is, this is in the lounge looking through to the kitchen and there's somebody sat on the chair 
on the other side that looks like they're reading, but there was nobody actually sat there at all. Ah, uh, that could be anything. So yeah, like like Craig said, man, you can see through the window. There's a figure there, but it could literally be anything. It could be. Um, this is like a taken a couple of seconds apart, but this is up the stairs, and um, as the so the, I think this is freeze frame freeze framed from footage, uh, so as they've come round the corner, there's this. I've not taken the best picture there, but it's it's a full form similar to the one outside the door. Like, like another, like a black smoky figure on yeah. the stairs. And there's the stairs, there's lots and lots of pictures. This one is quite creepy. So it, it, this one actually looks like this happened um, while somebody had been, had a marble thrown at their head. And as somebody had taken the picture, um, they didn't really, they didn't see anything. And as they've looked on a digital camera, this image was there. And it looks like a hand with a rosary. Um, yeah, it does. It looks like a little arm. But if you side note, my grandma and granddad used to have that carpet, <laughs> so yeah, Sean so definitely like grandparent again. vibes. So this isn't a picture from the six from the sixties. This is a recent picture. Um, well, yeah, because pictures oh, from know. the sixties wouldn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the um, the house is is still has exactly the same. Yeah, pretty much. Um, if you look at the next picture, this is them trying to recreate from the same spot. Oh, I thought it was also this. I was like, no. you can see him in the mirror. Yeah, but and that's that's <laughs> that's the point. That's the same mirror, the same camera position, but there's nobody in the mirror in the first picture. No. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah. So you can see him in the mirror. You can see so that um, that's that's Bill Bungay trying to debunk the picture, and he's like, oh shit, I can't. Really, can't. I can't. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, that's him. Uh, that's him trying but to debunk it and then failing pretty badly at it. Failed to debunk it, but still skeptic. Uh, yeah, skeptic. I, I mean, he tries. I think. I think what he tries to do is say, you know, just the fact that people are there. There's, um, you've got a lot of, you've heard a lot of stories. You know, your mind will be playing tricks with you, but then occasionally you'd be like, okay, I'm going to try and work this one out. Uh, this is one he failed at. Right. I'll stop sharing now. There is. Uh, oh no, there isn't one more actually. There I was going to say there. Uh, in the show notes as well, I'll show a particularly creepy video where um, a door on a on an old stereo hood opened, um, and you can stop sharing actually, Sophie. You know, um, yeah, a door on a uh, a glass door and a cat on a stereo hood opened, and they shut it, and then they sort of sat back down talking about it, and they're like, "Come on, you can do it again." And uh, just as they kind of give up, it then properly swings open and it's quite creepy to see that was one that i was like i showed Rhea and she had nightmares that night <laughs> wow so. okay so yeah hopefully everybody enjoyed that episode uh now we need to go and do the game of well not go we need to do the game of knife sheet ufo to decide who will be telling the story <laughs> next week so it's between me and sean Just Craig, I think I'm going to have nightmares about some of those, uh, those Go, bits and pieces. Have a look on um, the website. Sorry, Sophie, I know you want to play your game. <laughs> Let me see. Bear with me a sec. Oh, bear with me. Um, there is a particular link I'll put into the Twitch channel now and we'll share in the show notes. But this is all of the recent ones that people have taken. Uh, if anyone wants to have a look, it's, uh, yeah. The videos, the videos are really interesting. Yeah, Penny says, I really don't like these. Um, if I have nightmares over this, and uh, yeah, she so, 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 so Penny's not happy. Penny's not happy. Uh, I'm sorry, Penny. Next, Penny, <laughs> Penny in the Twitch chat, everyone. Yeah, just in the Twitch chat. Just uh, <laughs> anyone listening. And also, I apologize, Penny, for anything I said while steaming drunk doing Mary Ann Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Let's do let's do it. Let's do knife sheet I'm at UFO. Knife sheet UFO. You're the facilitator. A facilitator. Okay. Knife, sheet, UFO, shoot. Uh, oh, so we both did so sheet. That, both that sheet was heads. Nazi salute that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Knife, sheet, UFO, shoot. I win. Oh, shit, Sean I has to do a story next week. I got sheet. Sean got UFO. So, um, sheet covers UFO. <laughs>
Just so you know, if, in case you spot any UFOs, I have a sheet of paper to hand or a blanket <laughs> or throw. It's a blanket because that's the cover. When you cover yourself with a blanket, that's you're a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Scotty, so Scotty Cash says we definitely need to do a podcast from 30 East Drive. We should redo everything. this one from 30 East Drive. <laughs> I don't think I want to make fun of Fred when he's there. No. Fred will <laughs> yeah, be going, like, that's not how it happens. Oh, well, to be fair, Sophie, I mean, we've called him a nonce. You've been called a nonce. <laughs> you know, he, right. might, he might like you. Yeah, make it on. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> right, remember, everyone, be safe and text me when you get home. Bye. Bye. Bye.